Okay. I hope everybody's enjoying their first day of the best week of the year. Um, I'm so happy to be back in Auburn at the Mises Institute with all you fine people. So um, I get to talk about money, and it turns out money is a really uh, important topic, not just for us in life that we want money in our wallet, but it's an important topic. Uh, it's crucial in Austrian economics. Um, and it's central, and that's why we have it on the first day of the week, the first day of the conference. Um, in Austrian economics, we say that uh, analysis is done in money prices. Um, calculation, which we're going to be talking about uh, tomorrow and later in the week, calculation is only possible with money prices. And um, really, with money and extending beyond with what uh, – Professor Rittenauer said um, money and division of labor is really what allows civilization to develop. Um, if not for the Austrians, we would still have the state theory of money, that um, money is what the sovereign state said it is, and that's uh, <clears throat> that the currency has value just because of the sovereign's decree. Um, but in uh, 1892, we had um, Minger's uh, theory of money and told the story of how money originates, which I'll just be going through in a little bit. Uh, in 1912, Mises expanded on that and the regression theorem in his first book, The Theory of Money and Credit. Um, of course, we have other great works on money. Um, uh, of course, What Has Government Done to Our Money by Rothbard, and my favorite is actually The Mystery of Banking. Um, so, uh, money is an important topic That's for the Austrians. That's why we have it on our very first day, um, uh, important topic for us to get into so that we can then have the ground laid for um, uh, what we're going to do the rest of the week. So by the, end of the, by the end of this week, you'll be well-versed in uh, hopefully understanding why we're having this inflation that we're, price inflation that we're experiencing now. You know, it's not because of corporate greed, which we're hearing about. Um, it's not because of climate change. It's not even because of the Swifties. It's going to be about something. We'll, we'll understand why. We'll understand why we're having, uh, why we're uh uh, experiencing this price inflation now. Okay, so um, let's talk about, let's start with who needs money? We all, raise your hand, we all need money, right? Um, <clears throat> if we start with Robinson Crusoe, alone on the island, right? He has no need for money. Robinson Crusoe, he can't eat gold coins, even if we had, if he was you know, living under a gold standard, he would have no reason for having gold coins. That's not going to help him survive any better. Um, there's no shopping mall on this island where he's by himself for him to go spend his gold coins. Uh, even when he meets Friday, somebody else who shows up or he discovers somebody else on the island, uh, they really have no need for money to trade their fish and berries because they can just do that on the basis of their subjective values for those goods. But when society expands beyond just a few families, then the stage is set for the emergence of money. So um, remember, voluntary exchange happens because the two parties expect to do what? They expect to benefit. They expect to be better off from the exchange. And from Professor Rittenauer's lecture, um, these uh, exchanges come from um, this need or want to exchange comes from this variety, this big difference that we have in aptitude um, also, and our skills and abilities and also even the locations where we are. And from that natural fact comes, um, comes this impetus for exchange. And with specialization exchange through division of labor, um, we each develop our best skill where we have our proficiency, um, and each region develops its own particular resources. And so we found that compared to um, producing only for our own consumption um, and remaining self-sufficient, we found that we're much better off um, <clears throat> when, we when we specialize. We produce a limited number of goods, 
um, in abundance compared to what we would consume. We produce more than we'll consume to exchange it with others. Um, and we are much better off doing that, getting most of what we consume through exchange rather than self-sufficiently, uh, living self-sufficiently and nearly starving and probably going naked or close to naked, right? So we have a higher standard of living through specialization exchange. <clears throat> Um, but exchange for of goods for goods, or what we call barter or direct exchange, is hardly any better than remaining self-sufficient, right? That's really close to being self-sufficient because of the two basic problems of the two basic problems of barter. Um, some goods are indivisible. It's very difficult to divide them up into smaller exchangeable units, and then also the double coincidence of what wants requirements. So this year, um, in the spring, our youngest, some of you may have met Bonnie, he's a student here this week, but this year Bonnie turned 16 and started driving. So the mama taxi service after 26 years has closed up shop. So I handed down my car to Bonnie and I went to buy myself a new car. So here I am in my, uh, my new car, pretty uh, little silver Atlas. Um, and it turns out cars are really pretty expensive. Um, it is shocking. Um, but let's imagine me, when we're talking about barter, let's imagine me buying a car under conditions of barter. What can I offer in exchange? Well, I have specialized, um, where hopefully I am proficient, um, in economics lectures. So I teach economics at Baylor University, and not surprisingly, I'm very popular. <laughs> and uh, my classes are in high demand, no pun intended. Uh, my economics classes are in high demand, and my class always have long waiting lists to get in. Um, actually, here's the, uh, the registrar has a picture. These are <laughs> students who are... They were camped out waiting for a spot uh, in, in my class. Uh, so naturally, when I'm bartering with my economics lectures, I have a lot to bring to the table, right? Um, however, as amazing as my lectures are, uh, what if the car is more valuable? Uh, what if the car is, say, even twice as valuable in exchange as my economics lectures? What is the uh, Waco Volkswagen dealer going to do? Um, can he just sell me half a car? I mean, if we think about the indivisibility of goods, can he sell me half a car? And if so, which half would I want? Do I want the front half? There, the fr do I want the front half? Maybe I want, maybe just so I can get around, maybe I want the driver's side and not the passenger <laughs> side. Or what if the half of the car is the half without the engine and then we just run on Peter Power? <laughs> so that could work, right? So then I could say, okay, here's my course in, here's my course in money and they give me this car. So um, <clears throat> trading goods that are not easily divisible is going to be a hindrance to trade under barter. Um, but even when goods are divisible into smaller units though, it's very difficult for two exchangers to find each other. Right? Sometimes because this double coincidence of wants uh, requirement that I have to have what you want. I'm sorry. Yeah, I have to have what you want and you have to have what I want at the same time and in the same place where we can exchange. So, for example, if I have some really uh, incredibly passionate and eloquent economics lectures, Right, so people are hanging on my every word, um, <clears throat> and the Volkswagen dealer has this really beautiful mom mobile, right? That I think I just really want that. How are we going to get together if the Volkswagen dealer isn't interested in learning economics but wants to learn Taekwondo? Then we have we the exchange doesn't take place. I can't teach uh, Taekwondo, but don't mess with me. Okay, uh, so the survival of my for the survival of my economics uh, professor colleagues. I am glad that we don't live under barter anymore um, because I worry about us trying to eke out an existence 
um, based on just trading our economics lectures. Okay, so one more problem of barter besides the indivisibility of goods and the double coincidence of wants requirement is the number of prices. If every good trades against every other good, then we're going to have to have a price for my economics lectures or for the uh, or the Volkswagen Atlas in every other good, right? So for every good would have an array of prices, not just one money price, but an array of prices. And in a barter economy with only 1,000 goods, there would be almost half a million prices, okay? Um, for a sense of scale, I looked it up. The average Walmart carries over 120,000 goods. So a number. imagine the number of prices uh, that we would need without, without money. So um, Mises pointed out that as division of labor expands more and more and it gets finer and finer, uh, money becomes even more necessary. So it's clear that um, any sort of developed economy is really going to be impossible under direct exchange or barter. So um, <clears throat> under indirect exchange, when we have indirect exchange, you sell your good not specifically for the good that you need, not the good that you're going for, right? You sell it for another good that you can then in turn exchange it for the good that you want. And at first this seems like, gosh, you're just adding extra clunky steps in there. You're making this harder money instead of easier, right? Why can't I just trade my economics lectures for the car, right? Why can't I do that? Well, um, it turns out this is really not more difficult. It's simpler. It simplifies everything, um, and it actually allows us to go beyond self-sufficiency that we were um, close to being stuck. Uh, close to being stuck with self-sufficiency before, before indirect exchange. So under barter, if we go back to trading goods for goods, we can imagine that. Uh, goods would have different degrees of saleability, right? Some goods are easier to sell to sell in the market than than others. And the more saleable a good, the more easily its owner can find somebody to exchange with um, in the market. We can it's easier for them to find somebody who will make an exchange for them at some price. Okay, so um, someone who's selling rice taking rice to the market to exchange and barter, they're going to have an easier time uh, finding trading partners than I would if I'm taking my pool vacuum to the market and I'm looking for somebody who needs a pool vacuum. Um, <clears throat> uh, just for my own show, just for my own reference for later on to win an argument, do people know what a pool vacuum is by show of hands? Okay, Peter. Okay, do you see that? All right. Peter said, they're not going to know what that is. Okay, so anyway, uh, if with a pool vacuum, I'll have a more difficult time finding uh, trading partners. But of course, even that is not impossible, especially if I'm willing to discount my pool va vacuum. I'm willing to accept a much lower price uh, in exchange than what I may have been hoping for. Um, but clearly, a pool vacuum is less saleable than, say, rice. The person with rice will have an easier time finding trading partners. So owners of the relatively less sellable goods, like my pool vacuum, I will exchange my pool vacuum and other people who have less sellable goods will trade those not only for the goods that they directly want to consume, but for almost any other good that I don't directly value, but I will accept it as long as it's more saleable, more acceptable um, in the market than the good that I'm going to give up. So over time, Minger argued the most saleable goods were desired uh, by more and more traders because of this advantage, because it allows them to go and buy almost anything in the market. Okay, So the demand for the very saleable good changes, so it's not only demanded for its use value, but it's also demanded for its value in exchange, for its exchange value. So that good becomes then a medium of exchange where people are going and saying, I will take this good. It's not the good that I want. It's not the good I'm going to um, accomplish my purposes. It's not the good that I want, but it's going to allow me 
to then turn around and get the good that I do want. So this choice of a good or goods as a medium of exchange is a gradual self-reinforcing process that as more people accept it, the commodity then becomes even more marketable, even more saleable. Um, I've heard Bob Murphy make the point that he doesn't know or uh, that we don't know how long this adoption of this um, most saleable good, how long that process takes. But he said it might happen fairly quickly um, just because the people exchanging are going to very quickly recognize its obvious benefits of taking a more saleable good. Okay, so what makes a good be more likely uh, to become that medium of exchange? Um, well, if it's easily divisible, it's not like the car, if it's not like the, the mom mobile, if it's easily develop, divisible into smaller units without losing value when you break it into smaller pieces, if it's durable over, a, over long periods of time while exchanging hands and it's not breaking down, if it's easily transportable, Right, so that means it has to be, for very small units, it has to have a high value, high value to weight ratio. So we're not lugging, you know, pieces of iron um, to market. So also if it's fungible, one unit of money is basically equivalent to any other unit of money and if it's scarce. Um, eventually one or two commodities um, are, once they are used as the generally accepted, keywords, generally accepted medium of exchange, that is in almost all exchanges, then those goods are called money. Okay, so historically we've had lots of different commodities that have served as money. I've got some pictures here, some beads, some shells, uh, even some nails, um, but through the centuries, the one that has been chosen most often has been gold and silver. And these have displaced uh, other commodities and have served as generally accepted medium of exchange or money. Um, so Austrians, because we talk about superiority of gold uh, serving as medium of exchange, we get criticized and made fun of and called uh, gold bugs, and we like gold because it's shiny and pretty. Um, really, it's we like it because it is the, the commodity that's been chosen by the market um, more often than any other. But uh, Austrians, we'd be happy, just as happy with some other commodity if it worked as well as gold, even if it wasn't shiny and pretty. Um, okay, so Carl Minger pointed out it's not necessary or even really conceivable um, for money to be established by some authoritarian decree um, or by some explicit contract among the people. And in fact, there's really no historical record of that ever taking place. Um, <clears throat> the more plausible explanation, the one that makes sense and that we can easily say, yeah, that, that, that would work that makes sense, um, is that money originates spontaneously um, because the immediate and obvious benefit um, of using the more marketable good as a medium of exchange, that benefit is recognized by the parties involved, um, and so then it becomes adopted and becomes money. Um, it's hard to imagine anybody conceiving of the idea of money without experience it, experiencing it in that way. Right, if you're sitting around in a barter economy and you haven't experienced that, how is money going? The idea of money going to come into your, to your mind? So, uh, <clears throat> Minger said, "Here's a quote." He says, "Hence, it's also clear that nothing may have been so favorable to the genesis of a medium of exchange as the acceptance on the part of the most discerning and capable economic subjects for their own economic gain, and over a considerable period of time." of eminently saleable goods in preference to all others. That's from the origins of money. So uh, money is unlikely to have originated in any other way because uh, embedded in the demand for money <clears throat> is the knowledge of the past prices. What did this good, what did this commodity trade for under barter? What was kind of its value in exchange before it became a generally accepted um, medium of exchange? Unlike consumption goods, money has to have pre-existing prices, right? 
uh, and on that, then we can uh, have the grounds to base our demand for uh, to be, to base our demand for money on. So Mises explained this in his regression theorem that that can only happen by beginning <clears throat> with a subjectively valued useful commodity under barter and then adding to it the demand for the um, uh, medium of exchange to the uh, to the demand for use. So we have now this commodity has demand for use and the medium of exchange um, demand component as well. Um, so uh, we have, uh, we had uh, gold, we said, has been the one that's been chosen most often in the market. And then we had paper. So how did this, how this happen? Well, paper, um, compared to gold does not have as much value in exchange, right? So people wouldn't be willing to surrender, you know, I have worked and labored and built this, made this machine, and now I'm going to give it to you for paper. Doesn't make sense. So um, <clears throat> people were unwilling to surrender their goods for paper. But so how do we go from paying with commodity money like gold coins to paying with paper. Um, well, gold is heavy, right? It's heavier than paper, um, and it's dangerous to carry around. Somebody can come and knock you in the head and take your gold. But um, <clears throat> people started storing their gold in gold warehouses, and when you put your gold in the warehouse, you would get a receipt for your, for your paper claim for your gold that's stored there. And then to make purchases, you could either gold, go to the gold warehouse um, and withdraw some of your gold to go make your purchases, or for your convenience, you could instead just sign over your paper claim um, to the gold. And so eventually, uh, more and more people did that, and the... Um, <clears throat> the paper claims to the uh, gold deposits in the, um, the commodity money in the warehouses became generally accepted medium of exchange. Okay, so um, what are the benefits of money? So elimination of the uh, disadvantages of money, of course. Uh, the, all the problems of barter are gone. Uh, we don't have to worry about indivisibilities or double coincidence of wants. Uh, also, there's going to be a reduction in the number of prices for each good, right? Instead of going to from each good having a wide array of prices, now each good has one money price. Um, <clears throat> so we've already seen that without money, there could not really be real specialization um, and therefore no advancement of the economy above a primitive level. But with money, we can get this elaborate um, structure of production can be formed uh, with land, labor, and services, and capital goods, all receiving payment in um, in money at each stage of production. Um, <clears throat> So we have this, uh, this cooperation of these in the um, elaborate structure of production that can now be established. So um, also only with money can we have, um, can we have uh, rational economic calculation, right, where uh, businessmen can now do uh, compare revenues and costs in the same terms. Right, so now we can tell is this, uh, are we earning a profit or a loss when the costs and revenues are denominated in the same terms. So also with money, um, people can compare the market worth of each good to, to other goods. And this can be done, this can be done easily where if we have um, a gaming desktop computer, so my son has one of these, I don't, I, I had to, Look at my notes to even get the word right. A gaming desktop computer, if that costs about an ounce of gold um, and a new stripped down basic probably used Ford Escape costs 20 ounces of gold, then we can see that Escape is going to be worth what? How many gaming computers? About 20, right. So, um, <clears throat> so it's easy to make these comparisons now of value when they're all done with one in one um, 
uh, one commodity money. Okay, so most physical goods are sold in terms of weight. So tons, pounds, grams, ounces, um, <clears throat> and the size of the unit uh, really uh, doesn't matter because they can all be converted um, from one unit into another. So one pound is going to be 16 ounces, right? One ounce is 28.35 grams. Um, <clears throat> so uh, if gold is the chosen commodity money, the size of the unit that we use for the currency really does not matter. And we'll see that many different uh, units have been chosen. Um, so I can sell something for one ounce of gold in the U.S. or 28.35 grams in France, and these are the same price, right? Because those are the, ex the same weight just measured in different units. And this seems like, duh, how obvious. Why is she going on and on about this? Move on. Well, it's because people forget this. They forget this simple truth, um, and because of that, it creates a lot of confusion. And so uh, people think of uh, the money as being some abstract units of something. Even when we did have a gold standard, people thought in terms like this. They were like, well, in America, the money is dollars. And in France, it's francs before the euro. And in Germany, uh, it was marks. And so they're thinking in terms, like, in terms of that. However, all of those monies were tied to gold. All of them were um, tied to gold, but people thought of them as um, sovereign and independent monies, and they're thinking of the names and not that these are tied to some unit, some weight of gold. Um, <clears throat> so uh, before, uh, before government fiat money, um, the various names were just simply... Um, defined units of weight of the commodity gold. So before 1933, people would say that the price of gold was fixed at $20 per ounce. That's really, uh, while that's true, but it's really kind of a misleading way to say that. The correct way of looking at it would be to say that the dollar is the name given for one twentieth of an ounce of gold. That's really a more straightforward and honest way of putting it. Okay, so, um, but because of this misunderstanding, the money's being named different, of the money's just being names for defined units of weight um, of gold, it was misleading to talk about exchange rates. It's unclear what does all this mean, uh, but it's really pretty simple. So the pound sterling, um, we were told exchanges for five dollars. Okay, five dollars is one pound, um, but the dollar at that time was defined as one twentieth of a gold ounce, right? And the pound sterling at that time was one fourth of a gold ounce, and so we've got one twentieth of a gold ounce exchanging for, I mean, sorry, one fourth of a gold ounce is exchanging exchanging for five twentieths of a gold ounce. So one twentieth, uh, sorry. 5 twentieths equals 1 fourth. So it's really, um, it was really simple, but misunderstanding this or forgetting that um, these were tied to gold is what made, made it more difficult and more confusing. Okay, so what about the specific value of money? What exactly is the price of money? Um, so we can uh, get to that by think starting with something else, say my laptop. If I take my laptop to the market and I'm going to sell my used laptop, how much money would it command in the market? Okay, so my example is $100. Uh, it's probably closer to like 15 But anyway, uh, $100. So the purchasing power of my laptop, my laptop then is going to go and buy $100 if we think about it that way. So I could say that um, $1 then is going to buy 1% or 1 one hundredth of my laptop. And it's the same thing with money. If I sell my money, then what can I get for it in exchange? What can I get for my money in exchange? The laptop, when I went and sold my laptop to buy money, my laptop was only exchanging against money, but money trades against everything else. 
um, money trades against everything else. We need to list all the possibilities that one dollar trades for, right? So a uh, dollar buys one one hundredth of my laptop. A dollar buys one pack of gum. Apparently not anymore. It's gum, even gum is not. You can't get a pack of gum for a dollar anymore. Um, it buys one. 30,000th of, apparently, because I've used, recently been in the car market, a really crappy used car, but um, <clears throat> uh, so money has this array of prices. So we think of what is the purchasing power of money. It's this whole array or, or quantities of other goods and services that the money commands in exchange. Um, so the purchasing power of the dollar is the inverse or the reciprocal of the overall price level. <clears throat> so if all the prices double, the general price level doubles, what happens to the purchasing power of money is it's cut in half. Now a uh, dollar, instead of buying one one hundredth of my laptop, it buys one two hundredth of my, of my laptop. So um, <clears throat> purchasing power of money can be thought of as the price of money, where the price, just like with other goods, is determined by supply and demand. And just like with supply of demand, um, I mean, just supply of demand for other goods, um, <clears throat> excuse me, if there's an increase in supply, uh, if there's increase in supply of this good, then it loses value, declines in value in exchange. If there's a decrease in supply, then its exchange value rises. Um, if there's increase in demand for money, its value in exchange rises. If there's a decrease in demand for money, um, <clears throat> its value in exchange falls. So we should note here demand for money, uh, when we're using it in this way, demand for money is not just how much money you want, right? You need to say, I, I, I would never say I didn't want any more money. But the demand for money in this case is we're referring to as the amount you wish to hold in cash balances. Okay, so what is the optimal supply of money? What's the optimal supply of money? We always hear the Federal Reserve, they're increasing the money supply, or they're going to tighten the money supply. Um, <clears throat> what should the money supply be? Is there an optimal amount? Does that optimal amount ever change? Okay. Uh, Rothbard points out, this is really a silly question. Nobody is asking, what's the optimal amount of tennis shoes? What's the optimal amount of pizzas? Nobody is... Uh, nobody's asking that or for the optimal amount of any other good. Um, <clears throat> the reason why is there's an increase in consumer and producer goods um, that are going to be used up and worn out. Uh, when we have an increase in those, those make us better off, right? Because more human wants are satisfied by these uh, uh, by these extra consumer goods and producer goods. But money is different. <clears throat> As a medium of exchange, money is not used up and worn out. It's transferred from one person's cash balance to another's cash balance. So that's why uh, any money supply, any amount of money is just as good as any other in performing the medium of exchange function. Um, the purchasing power of money will always adjust uh, to permit all the exchanges to occur that people desire to make. Um, a money supply of $20 billion is able to fa finance the exact same number of transactions as a money supply of $200 billion. Okay, With a smaller money supply, the price level would be lower. With a higher money supply, the price level would be higher. <clears throat> we can see the effects of an increase in money supply um, with uh, the story of the angel Gabriel. Um, in the story, a benevolent but economically ignorant um, spirit descends to earth and wants to uh, benefit mankind and decides the best way to do this by magically working some voodoo and doubling everybody's uh, cash balances overnight while we sleep. Okay, uh, When we wake up, every person finds that we have excess cash balances. We have more money in our bank account than our demand for demand for um, holding cash balances and at the prevailing price level we rush out and we go and spend and buy more consumer and producer goods with this extra cash balances okay the result is there's 
increase in demand for these goods and services. And what happens when there's increase in demand for goods, the price of those goods will rise. And so uh, the price level rises and it turns out society will be no better off uh, from the angel Gabriel's doubling of all cash balances because no additional human wants were satisfied with the same number of goods and services, um, same number of productive resources. Those have remained fixed. Um, technology didn't improve, so we're no better off. Uh, no additional needs have been met. So um, despite the doubling of the number of monetary units, um, the real money supply, which is the amount of money divided by the price level, that's remained unchanged because they both they both doubled. Price level, I'm um, sorry, the purchasing power of money has just been cut in half. Okay, but if you look a little bit more closely at what the angel did, um, <clears throat> then we can see that actually the people who spent the money early, they were benefited at the expense of the people who spent it later, even though all people received the same proportional increase in their cash balances. So the early birds, or who I call my freaks, um, they wake up early and they rush out, right? And they go and they, uh, they spend their money before the prices have risen. Okay, so they get out there and so they have gained in real income. But those who slept late or waited a few days because we are showing prudence and <clears throat> wisdom in our spending choices. We waited a few days before we went to spend the money. Um, we then spend after the prices have risen and our cash balances have decreased in, uh, dramatically in purchasing power. So the increase in money supply did not benefit mankind or society as a whole, but the early spenders are benefited at the expense of the late spenders. So since every money supply is equally optimal, and a larger money supply is no more beneficial to society than a smaller money supply, nobody, including economists and the central bakers and anybody else, nobody needs to be concerned with what the optimal money supply is because the price level will adjust so that every money supply will finance all the transactions that we want to make. Okay, so... Um, uh, I want to talk a little bit about um, supply of gold and the counterfeiting process um, under the gold standard. Under the gold standard, the one and only way to increase the money supply is to dig more gold out of the ground, right? So mining. Uh, mining is a costly activity and it takes scarce resources to do it. So the money supply under the gold standard is really determined by the profitability of mining. Right, the profitability of gold mining. Profitability of gold mining, revenues minus costs, that's going to be affected by the price level, by the cost of mining gold. Um, if these costs fall, the cost of mining gold fall, then mining becomes more profitable and we'll see more of it happening. When the price level rises, then gold mining is less profitable and production will decline or may even disappear altogether. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, the price level in there, <clears throat> when the price level rises, the price of the resources, um, oh, I already said that the price, when the price level rises, then we'll see that gold mining is less profitable. Okay. So we should point out that an increase in commodity money, when we're digging more gold out of the ground, um, that does benefit society, right? Because not all of it necessarily has to become uh, gold coins in the money supply, um, but it can have uh, consumption value. So it can go into pr uh, productive uses or um, jewelry, and also apparently it's used in electronics. So you can get it by buying it or mining it, or you could also counterfeit it, right? You could also uh, get gold, for, that would be fraudulently getting it by um, counterfeiting it. So I want us to look at the effects of counterfeiting so we can better understand the inflation process. So let's say some bad guys or girls, equal opportunity, some bad guys, um, I'm including girls in that, but anyways, the bad guys, they get together and they decide to mint um, some counterfeit gold coins, uh, and they're actually made of brass, but these 
fake coins, fake gold coins that they make are uh, to the naked eye. They're not. It's not easily distinguishable. They go undetected when the bad guys spend them, when the counterfeiters spend the money. Okay, so they spend these fakes. They go out and they spend these fakes, and they increase the money supply. And in doing so, they're increasing demands for the goods that they buy. Right, So they go and buy more because they have this extra cash now, this fake cash. So that increases the, um, the price level and decreases the purchasing power of money. Okay, So this is just like the Angel Gabriel story, except there's one crucial distinction. Remember, Angel Gabriel increased everybody's cash balances, but the, uh, with the counterfeiters, this new fake money, it's going to enter the economy at a specific point, right? So uh, it, that money enters the economy where the counterfeiters go and buy goods. So whatever the bad guys are buying, use your imagination, they spend the money there. And then where they bought their money, where they bought, those people now have more cash balances and they spend it and spend it and it gets respent throughout the economy. And as it goes, then there will be increased demand at these, as it ripples out. And so increased demand for those goods and the price level gradually rises. So the result is the demand for local goods bought by the bad guys increases first and then and increases those prices. Then it gets respent and spread until eventually all prices are all prices are affected. Okay. So the counterfeiters and those that they buy from, they get the money early in the process and they benefit at the expense of those who get it much later or not at all. So the people who uh, the people who are late in the process, if we think of, say, what, the one we always hear of, the widow on a fixed income, right? So if we think of the widows on fixed income, they're going to be worse off because they saw this, uh, so they see this increase in money supply not at all. They're on the same income but at a higher price level. They're at the same income with lower um, lower purchasing power. So they are made worse off. So it's not the and unvaccinated who are killing grandma. It's really these dang counterfeiters. So <clears throat> them, get them. Okay, so uh, leave the rest of us alone. So counterfeiting is really a subtle method of fraudulently gaining um, at the expense of the rest of society through this an inflation process. It's a transfer. It's a transfer from those who get the money late to those who get to spend the new money first. We can see this through the um, through the example of the of the counterfeiters. Okay, so um, last thing, we would not expect money to be paper. Paper, we said, has a low uh, value in exchange. It's also very easy. It's very inexpensive to uh, to produce, right? Just turn on the printing press, and especially now, it doesn't even have to be printed. It can just be some keystrokes. So just how long it takes me to do like that. So it's very easy um, to produce. But paper, um, very cheap and easy to produce, probably why it's chosen. Also, we would not expect money to be national. Okay, now we're back to the double coincidence of wants requirement at the border. I go up to um, Canada or to Mexico and ugh, I got to have different money before I can buy anything there or I have to find somebody who wants who wants dollars for their goods. Um, we would not expect money to be under the control of any entity. Why would it need to be that when any supply of money um, will adjust in value to enable us to make any all the transactions that we want to make? So if we would not expect money to be paper or national or um, under the control of any entity, why is it that we see it that way now? Well, um, we're going to hear a lot more about this this week. But it's just as we saw at the counterfeiters, issuing currency is a way to transfer wealth to the issuer. 
right? And so it turns out a monopoly in some geographic region, if you can be the one who gets to be the, the, if you can be the one who gets to decide how much money we're going to have in circulation, um, that is a very valuable tool to have. And that's the monopoly that the state has found is what works for them. It's a very powerful, desirable tool. So we'll hear more about, a lot more about that this week. So thank you very much.